Okay, I think we can uh, get started. Um, so, um, uh, good morning and good afternoon, Canada, and good evening, depending on where you are on this small planet. We are with you with another uh, webinar of GWF Thematic Webinar on hydroeconomics team. The main objective of this core modeling component is to develop a new generation of integrated and hydroeconomic models for Canada, establishing links and relationship between socioeconomic activities and water use. The focuses are three main pillars, uh, the upscaling and downscaling of hydro hydrological and environmental and economic data from watershed and drainage basin to provincial and national level. The inclusion of water and watershed in macroeconomic modeling and frameworks, the introduction of feedback loops, uh, the water use, for example, and water quality and economic productivity. For today's uh, webinar, uh, uh, we have Professor Roy Breyer from University of Waterloo. Uh, he is the executive director of Water Institute at University of Waterloo. He has previous experience at Dutch uh, Water Ministry, therefore he has a good knowledge and understanding of governmental and organizational institute. Roy main research interests are in water resources economics, in particular water resource evaluation, hydroeconomics modeling and water policy instrument. The second half of the webinar is presented by Dr. Uh, Jorge Garcia Hernandez. Jorge obtained his PhD degree in system design engineering from University of Waterloo, and he's busy working in the Global Water Future projects. I'm personally looking forward to hear more uh, from them. They're a small group, but mighty. Uh, at the end, uh, on behalf of the core modeling team, uh, Martin Clark, Al Petroniro, uh, Joy Mitsugiani, and me, myself, and I, Sherman Garari, uh, we hope that you enjoy this uh, webinar. Roy and Jorge, uh, the floor is yours. We can share your screen and we continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherman. Can you hear me? And you can see the slides? Uh, yes, we can Great. hear you and see the slide. All perfect. Great. Um, so thanks for the invitation for the annual update on how we're advancing on hydroeconomic modeling for Canada in the Global Water Futures Project. As you mentioned, I'm going to give a presentation together with George. Um, I'm going to start with a brief overview, then George is going to take over, then he's going to hand it over back to me, and then in both our presentations we'll, we'll discuss some of the next steps that we are planning to undertake related to our work. Um, for those of you who've seen me present in this webinar series before, they probably recognize this uh, coin. It's uh, the Roman god Janus, who's two-faced. He can look backwards and forwards. Um, and this is to illustrate um, the work that we're doing under this uh, heading of hydroeconomics. In order to develop hydroeconomic models, integrated hydroeconomic models, we also need to have the uh, data that um, we need to validate and calibrate these, uh, these models. So the work consists of a, an accounting uh, component um, where we look back uh, based on available data and information about the uh, interaction of economic activities with the water system. And what we learn from these interactions in the past will be the basis for our predictions of how water policy interventions are expected to affect both the water system and our economic system. There's also a, a, a picture that I, um, I, I've used many times before, um, very simple um, schedule of how the economy interacts with, with the water system. Uh, we use the water system as a source and as a sink. We take, it, we take water out, we use it in our economic activities. Once we've used it, um, it often goes back as uh, wastewater into, uh, after some treatment into the, into the water system. And in the accounting work that we are uh, doing, we're looking at coupling available data and information about economic flows um, to water flows um, and also emission flows. Um, and this is work that we presented um, to you in the past. So I'm not going to um, uh, hold on to that very long. Um, just to show you this slide that more recently, we've also added um, Stats Canada survey of drinking water plants, where we try to make a connection between land cover data, water quality data, and water treatment costs. And you see below two um, uh, publications that are related 
to this. So we're making use as much as possible of available data and information, and we try to um, combine that in a smart way um, to be able to say something about the value of water in different economic activities. This is a, another slide I've presented various times before, um, showing you that um, two very um, uh, core pieces of work are happening on Saskatchewan site and, um, and here in Ontario. The Saskatchewan River Basin has been a, um, the focus of, of a PhD thesis by Leila Eamon, um, who I co-advised together with Saman Razavi from University of Saskatchewan. Um, and uh, George and I are focusing primarily here on the Great Lakes Basin um, and the economic value of the water um, in that particular basin. What we're, we're aiming to do in Global Water Futures is to have this set of multi-regional, multi-sector input-output models that allow us to look at both the direct and indirect economic impacts of water policy interventions, uh, external changes, uh, the effect of climate change on our uh, water economy, and do that in a consistent way across Canada by making use of the uh, Canadian system of national account that is um, put together every year by Statistics Canada. And George will talk a little bit more about that um, in his part of the presentation when he presents the social accounting matrix that he uses. Um, I um, am going to present you here um, a, a, a fairly simple overview of, of, of the presentation today um, and what we've been presenting to you before. Um, so we're working at different scales, watershed, river basin, national scale, using different types of models. Um, in Global Water Futures. Um, we've presented you um, some of the results coming out of these multi-regional, multi-sectoral input-output models for the Saskatchewan River Basin. Leila Iman has been given presentations um, um, in, in many different places. Um, we've been presenting our work um, in the Great Lakes Basin in one of the previous uh, sessions uh, related to, to this webinar series. Um, we're, we're focusing on river basins in these, in these models. Um, so for the Saskatchewan River Basin, the data and information that was available at provincial level uh, for Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba was scaled down to uh, um, sub-basins within the Saskatchewan River Basin. We did similar um, um, exercises here in the Great Lakes Basin where we allocated economic activities to, to the different uh, lakes in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, an important um, extension of the work that we did here in the Great Lakes Basin was that we didn't um, uh, just uh, downscale the provincial data to the Great Lakes Basin. We also did, um, did it the other way around where the data and information at the level of the, uh, the individual lakes was scaled up to the provincial but also to the national uh, uh, level to be able to also say something about what are the uh, total economic impacts of changes in our water system in the Great Lakes Basin um, for the Great Lakes uh, economy, for the uh, economy of Ontario, and for Canada as, as a whole. So those presentations were, were given actually uh, last year around this time. Um, and today, what George and I will be uh, talking about is the work that we're doing on computable general equilibrium modeling, which is an extension of the, um, of the input-output model um, at national level initially. And then George has plans to downscale that further to the um, river basins. Um, and I'll be presenting something on um, the, the work that we're doing on coupled modeling um, at watershed scale. We also look at the um, non-market impacts um, of changes in our water system, both in terms of quantity and quality. Um, that is not going to be addressed uh, here um, uh, today, uh, maybe in the, in, in, the, in the near future. So I'm going to hand over now to, to George, who's going to kick off with, with, with his work on the uh, CGE model. George? Thank you, uh, Professor Brower. So hello, everyone. My name is uh, George Garcia, and I will be discussing the advances in hydroeconomic modeling uh, for Canada, which is mainly the development of a more comprehensive and more powerful modeling tool called Computable General Equilibrium or CGE model. So next, please. So, so far we've been using uh, input output tables and input output uh, models on quadratic programming. However, this tool has some limitations, uh, namely, for example, that prices are not included and prices are a very important mechanism to compensate 
uh, supply or demand shocks. So those are not included in the traditional input output models. And they are also valid for a short term analysis. Uh, and they also model a portion of the economy, namely the industry side, which is the consumption and production of uh, commodities. So using this approach, we've uh, produced uh, two papers. One has been accepted and the other is in a second round of um, revisions. So hopefully it also gets accepted in a journal. So we want to move to a computable general equilibrium model, which is a square system, uh, namely that you have the same number of variables as the number of equations. Most of the equations are uh, nonlinear and you have a number of advantages. First of all, you have uh, price variables uh, in the commodities and industries and the factors of productions. Uh, you have the possibility for the industries to have some technological change depending on what makes more uh, economical sense for each industry. You also allow to have the uh, primary input shocks and also this could be expandable to include uh, pollution emissions. So um, to, to construct one, uh, sorry, just to, uh, if you could, yeah, just to, rip, to finish this off. Yeah, so there's, a, there's not many CGE models out there because they are time consuming to construct um, and, and you need a lot of data to do that. So in, in the case of Canada, there is uh, two uh, water CGE models that we are aware of. Uh, one is uh, the 2013 one is uh, related to it's more focused on energy sources and the self supply water pricing and the 2015 is more related to uh, economical damages of flooding so we, we are thinking that uh, there's some space for a novel contribution here having a water supply or water, water quality uh, cge model for, for canada so next uh, slide please yeah so the cge model requires two pieces one is the data and the other is the actual specification of the model the data is a matrix and it's called social accounting matrix, uh, which is a comprehensive uh, recording of data and transactions by the economical agents in a given uh, space, in, in, a, in a given economy, in a given time. So the purpose of this is basically to get a snapshot of the economy and to have the initial values for the CGE model. Plainly speaking, the SAM or social accounting matrix is a block matrix that is composed by sub matrices that record uh, economical transactions. And, and the idea behind this is to look at the economy as a system where you have uh, elements and interrelations. And for example, just looking at the diagram there, we have activities or industries. They consume uh, factors of production and they produce uh, commodities but they also consume commodities. We have on the other hand, uh, institutions or economical agents. They supply factors of production, for example, labor or capital, but they also consume uh, commodities. So this system is open to the rest of the world via uh, commodity exchanges or factor uh, exchanges. So, th so this is the main idea of having a social accounting matrix. It's like a snapshot of the economy. Next one, uh, please. So uh, unfortunately, in, in the case of uh, Canada, there is no available social accounting matrices. Uh, you have to uh, construct them using information from Statistics uh, Canada. And we created a procedure to, to do so. So it's retrieving different data sources uh, from Statistics Canada and creates uh, detailed or large social accounting matrix, which has uh, as aggregated accounts commodities, margins, which are the transaction costs, industries, the factors of production for economical agents, some savings and investment accounts and the rest of the world account. And, and a depiction of it is uh, the table that you see there. Uh, one feature of the SAM is that the, well, first of all, it's a square matrix. And second, the row wise summation has to equal the column wide summation. So this uh, feature is not always the case because this data is coming from different sources. So you have to do some balancing to have the matrix as it's supposed to be. So we did that using uh, linear programming. 
uh, we created a procedure uh, that balances the, the matrix and, and gives us uh, you know the balance matrix that then we can use to, into the CGE. So next one, please. And next one. Mm -hmm. Then uh, because uh, but now we are interested in obtaining what's been paid for water, what's the valuation of natural resources and land. So we set up a secondary uh, procedure in which the user defines, for example, which commodities to single out. For example, that could be some uh, water services, which industries to single out as well, and the year of the table. Uh, and then we are also using information on water flows and water payments from uh, Statistics Canada uh, yeah, to get how much industries are paying to uh, obtain water. We are also using some specific, some formula to obtain the valuation of the natural resources and land using some uh, formula from from the GTAP documentation, which is the Global Trade Analysis Project. It's a very well known uh, project that um, and software that develops these CGE models for Europe. And then in the end, in the end we have uh, five primary inputs, labor, capital, natural resources, land, and water. Next one, please. So moving on to the actual CGE model, uh, here we have five blocks of equations that we have to define. The first one are the prices, and here we are specifying what are the relationship between the different uh, prices of, of the model. Here we, we, we have prices for the consumer, prices for the producer, import prices, export prices, uh, not only that, but we also have to specify here the taxes that are, are being paid by these different uh, consumers and the uh, margins, which are the transaction costs. Uh, all in all here, uh, we have 12 sets of uh, equations. So that, and the next one, please. Then we have the production structure, which we have defined at the moment to have three levels. At the very top, the user is able to specify whether they want the industry output to be a constant elasticity of substitution function or a Leontier one. In the second level, we have intermediate inputs, uh, the one that says quinta i, and that's defined as a Leontier function uh, because this is uh, common in CGE models. Uh, and then for the value added, we have de defined a constant elasticity of substitution uh, based on the primary inputs. So here we have eight sets of equations. Then uh, the next one, please. So this is the commodity structure. Here we start at the very bottom. And here we have, for example, QA1, QA2, all the way to QAI. So those are different industries that produce, uh, for example, the same commodity C. And that's uh, being produced using a GL coefficient or fixed coefficient. Now the, the local production, the domestic production QX in the middle is going to determine from which industry makes more economical sense to produce. And that's done using a constant elasticity of substitution. Now that domestic production has to decide also to which market to sell, whether domestic or foreign. So they have to decide if they want to uh, allocate those commodities to exports or uh, internal markets. So that's done using a constant elasticity of transformation or set in the middle. Now at the very top, that's the uh, domestic consumer. So the domestic consumer is also making this decision whether to buy from the domestic market, QD, or the imports, which is QM. Uh, so, and that's specified using a constant elasticity of substitution uh, function. So these are 10 sets of equations that we have to define here. Next one, please. And then we have the economical agents. Uh, on the left, we have the wages or prices of the factors of production and the quantity that it's been used. Uh, that gives us the YF, which is the income of the factors that is uh, transferred to YI which is the income of the economical agents. Those agents have some transfers among themselves and they also allocate some budget to buy commodities. That budget is divided into some subsistence uh, commodities, which is the minimal that they need to purchase. And, uh, and whatever budget is left, 
it's been spent using some marginal consumption of uh, commodities. Now, some of the income of the agents, YI, goes to the white cap, which is the um, capital accounts. And that is uh, also further divided into gross fixed capital formation, inventories, lending, and borrowing. And throughout this, there are some um, transfers with the rest of the world that we have to also include in the model. So here are 16 sets of equations to describe this situation. Next one, please. And finally, we have the block of equations for the system equilibrium, which includes the financial flows balance, the rest of the world balance, the commodity balance, and, and other equations. In all, we have 56 sets of equations. Uh, the number of variables uh, and the number of equations are the expression that you see there. As you may notice, uh, the difference between those numbers uh, is only one. So that implies that there is one redundant equation, which is good. That's expected. Uh, so what we, or what it's typically done, is to create a dummy variable and make it uh, set it equal to the redundant variable, and that has to be zero all the time. So whenever you do any uh, shock in the model, the way in which you ensure that the model is well defined uh, and sound is that the that dummy variable has to be always zero. Uh, so this this is happening in, in our model. So this is telling us that the, the model is well defined. So next one, please. So just to show uh, a couple of uh, results, uh, something else I want to say is that this model requires a lot of parameters. Some of them you can specify from the baseline values, meaning the sum. Uh, but th there are other parameters that you actually have to look into the literature to, to see what's the appropriate value. So we are still uh, you know, in, in that process of defining appropriate, um, for example, constant elasticity of substitution coefficients. So, but anyway, here we are um, doing a water supply shock in, in both sides. Uh, we are increasing water up until 50% more and decreasing water up until 50% less. And we can see that the response in the GDP is uh, nonlinear. Uh, something to notice here is that when you reduce um, a water, the drop in, in GDP is higher than the gain that you get increasing water, because the drop is 0 0.08 when you are reducing water. When you are increasing, you are only gaining 0 0.04. So there's some asymmetry there. The, the water price rate uh, is behaving as expected. When you have less water, it's uh, more costly to uh, obtain water resources. When you have more water, it's, it becomes uh, cheaper. We are also showing the behavior of uh, some sectors there in the upper right graph. Uh, and we can see that mining is uh, the most uh, sensible sector. Uh, to water responses at the moment. Agriculture and manufacturing are uh, showing a more damped uh, response. And something else we wanted to mention is that uh, here we have a lot of more information from, from, the, um, from the economy. And for example, just having this water shock is also having an effect in the balance of commerce, which is the exports minus imports. And we can see, for example, in the baseline, which is the line that's that has uh, water availability zero, that would be the baseline is already an, in deficit. And if you decrease water, the deficit increases. If you increase uh, water supply availability, then the deficit decreases. So this, this actually makes sense because when you are decreasing uh, water, then that means that it becomes more expensive to get water. And that also is translated into a higher price into certain commodities. So the consumer is going to probably switch to uh, import. So, so this is what this is, uh, this graph is reflecting that behavior. So um, yeah, so it's behaving as expected. Next one, please. And just to quickly show that we can also do uh, sector-wise uh, shocks. For example, in the case of utilities, in this case, utilities uh, is actually very sensitive to changes in water, which is expected because water is a main component of uh, utilities. And if we move to the next one, please. 
Also with manufacturing, yeah, you, you, you can uh, have these sector-wise uh, shocks. And if we go to the next one, please. Yeah, so the future steps here are, yeah, we want to uh, disaggregate the economy by major drainage regions. Uh, we want to uh, further tune the calibration procedure and include also the uh, emission of uh, pollutions, pollution and, and introducing a dynamic uh, behavior. So that would be uh, everything on my end. So thank you. Thank you, George. So I'll continue um, in the next 20 minutes or so. I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through uh, another uh, piece of work, which is at a, at a lower aggregated scale. It's, it's at the scale of a watershed, the, the Grand River watershed, um, where we've been um, assisting the uh, local authorities in, in the selection of um, best management practices on agricultural land to, to reduce nutrient runoff from that from that land, and it's uh, it's it's highly um, multi interdisciplinary work, um, as you can see from the names listed here, who were involved in this from different uh, uh, departments here at the University of Waterloo. People from the University of Guelph um, uh, were involved in this, and um, um, this was work in direct collaboration also with the Grand River Conservation Authority, who's implementing the rural water quality program here in the Grand River watershed um, that tries to stimulate farmers to take up. Um, these best management uh, practices. And so um, a, a question that, that, that um, puzzles um, a lot of um, conservation authorities here in, in, in Ontario is um, what, what are the best, uh, best management practices um, that, they, that they should um, fund with the limited resources that they, that they have um, available. And so what we did here was develop a so-called so decision support tool um, um, where we try to achieve different reduction levels of, um, of phosphorus running um, off the agricultural land into the river, and then ultimately ends up in Lake Erie, one of the uh, most uh, polluted lakes here in the Great Lakes uh, uh, Basin. Um, so you probably all know there are major eutrophication challenges here in the Great Lakes Basin, especially in, in the most shallow lake, Lake Erie. Um, some people have been estimating the um, um, economic costs of that uh, eutrophication and came up with this number that you see here, 270 million Canadian dollars, just on the Canadian side um, per, per year um, for Lake Erie only. Um, there are some policy um, um, guidelines in place already for the Eastern uh, Basin here, um, where they want to reduce um, the total phosphorus loading by 40% based on 2008 uh, baseline uh, levels. Um, there are no such policy guidelines here on the right-hand side um, yet for the, um, uh, for the uh, Eastern Basin. So this is obviously the Western Basin. I'm, I, I think I mentioned that that was the Eastern Basin. The Eastern Basin doesn't have uh, these uh, policy guidelines yet, but we're expecting that they um, might be introduced uh, as well. And then in, in the watershed where we, where we um, uh, are, the Grand River watershed, that's the largest contributor of phosphorus um, in, the, um, in the Eastern um, Lake Erie um, Basin. So what we um, uh, were looking at um, was how we can reduce the amount of phosphorus running off agricultural land through the Grand River entering um, Lake Erie. Um, so we want to impose a restriction on what comes out here at the mouth of the river um, by looking at what can be done. This is more or less the, 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 the shape of the, um, of the, of the watershed. Um, what can be done across the watershed um, to reduce uh, nutrient levels um, in, the, in, in the least cost way. Um, and this is the Canada Ontario Lake Erie Action Plan for the, um, for the Western Basin. So that's the main objective, um, identify what we uh, call cost-effective strategies to reduce these uh, total phosphorus loads into Lake Erie. And we wanna identify not only which BMPs are most cost-effective or, or so the uh, arrive at this um, uh, solution or this reduction at the lowest cost possible. We also want to know where these BMPs should be um, implemented. And for that, we developed this decision support tool. Um, we're basing ourselves on a rural water quality program that I referred to before that is being administered in the watershed by the Grand River Conservation Authority. Um, they allowed us access to um, around two decades 
of, um, of data and information about uh, different um, types of BMPs that they implemented um, and the financial costs associated with, with, with their implementation and, and how much nutrients were retained on the agricultural land as a result of the implementation of these um, uh, uh, BMPs. Um, so here are the um, types of measures that we looked at um, um, so far, uh, a reduction in the fertilizer uh, rate, um, that's a cost sharing measure, CS, uh, cover crops, which is um, uh, part of an in incentive payment scheme in the Grand uh, River, so farmers don't get uh, part of their costs of um, um, implementing cover crops uh, on their land in winter and spring, um, but they get, they get a, um, a per hectare incentive payment for actually uh, doing that. Then there are buffer strips um, that can be implemented at diff different widths, um, and that is a combination of cost sharing and incentive payments. And then there are the uh, uh, wetlands, the restoration of wetlands on, um, on agricultural land, 2% of all agricultural land or 4% of agri all agricultural land. That those are more or less the targets that the uh, Conservation Authority set itself. And again, there also we have a combination of cost sharing and incentive payments. Um, what is new here is that, that we conduct this cost effectiveness analysis for the first time for the entire watershed. Um, and we, we in, introduce both financial and, and economic costs. So there is a big difference in, in economics between what is financial and what is, what is economic, uh, economics. Um, so the financial costs refer in this case to what it costs um, uh, the province um, um, of Ontario, uh, the Grand River Conservation Authority, um, who manage then this rural water quality uh, uh, program um, in, in terms of the uh, financial flows that go from the Conservation Authority to the farmers as part of the cost sharing and incentive payments that these farmers receive once they sign up um, for this uh, rural water quality uh, program. The economic costs may be much higher. Cost sharing obviously already indicates that not all the costs will be um, 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 uh, covered or um, uh, reimbursed, um, but more, more, more importantly, perhaps, is also the fact that if you um, start reducing the productivity of um, highly productive agricultural land, um, the total economic costs may be substantially higher um, than the financial um, incentive payments, for example, or the uh, costs uh, sharing um, uh, amounts that farmers uh, receive. And what we're interested in, um, ultimately, um, for Canada as a whole, are these economic costs um, of implementing these, these BMPs. So what does it mean if we take productive land out of production or part of that uh, productive land out of production in economic terms? And, and, and there are longer term uh, consequences related to that um, that may be very different from the uh, short term financial cash flows that go from the Conservation Authority to the, uh, to the farmers. Um, I already listed the different types of, um, of measures, most of them are conventional, um, and then we have these so-called nature-based um, uh, wetlands that we also included in our choice set, um, and we account for spatial upstream downstream effects. So what you typically see in these cost effectiveness analyses um, here in Canada, but also elsewhere, is that it is um, um, uh, focusing on the pressure reduction. It, it looks at the costs of implementing BMPs and what it means um, 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 in terms of reducing the amount of fertilizer, for example, that you put on the land. What we're ultimately interested in is how that reduction of fertilizer put on the land um, 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 comes into effect in the quality of the river and ultimately the quality of the lake. And for that, uh, economists have to collaborate with, with, with environmental scientists um, who have access to these environmental water quality models that allow us to um, translate the pressure reduction to the impacts on water quality um, in, the, in the water. And that's what we uh, did here. What you typically see also in these coupled model, models is that you have a simulation and an optimization um, uh, component. Economists optimize everything. We want to maximize the benefit. We want to minimize the costs um, in, in these water quality um, uh, models, what happens is that you simulate flows, you, you si simulate uh, concentration levels of, um, of, of substances that you don't, uh, preferably won't, don't want to have in that, in, that, in that water. So there's no optimization taking place there, um, but we use the results from the simulation 
um, of these uh, environmental water quality models as input in our economic uh, optimization problem uh, uh, model. Yeah, so um, um, I will show you a few slides after this about the specific model that we re were using. What we have here is this pressure reduction that I was referring to. Um, we run it through SWOT that then tells us um, based on the relationship um, between the land and the water, how this pressure reduction impacts the water quality in these different uh, sub parts of the uh, Grand River watersheds. And then ultimately um, results in this reduction of the total phosphorus load at the mouth of the river um, where the river enters Lake Erie. That is what we're interested in. We're imposing a restriction on the, on the loads that come out of the mouth of the river. And then we go upstream to identify which measures should be um, taken, uh, uh, where exactly throughout the watershed to ensure that we re um, achieve that uh, load reduction at the mouth of the river at the lowest cost possible. And that is what we do here in the optimization uh, model. Yeah, so we impose this uh, load reduction. We know what the costs of these BMPs are, um, the different types of BMPs in the different types of subbasins, because um, that's something else. There is not a uniform cost, especially not economically speaking, for these BMP measures, because there is um, uh, heterogene heterogeneity in uh, spatially um, in the productivity of the land, for example. And so how much economically will be lost as a result of implementing these BMPs throughout the, um, the, 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 the watershed. And ultimately what we're uh, doing here is we're, we're minimizing the costs of implementing these BMPs to achieve this um, uh, load reduction. So SWOT was used, soil and water assessment tool. Um, that's not my piece of cake. We have other people on the team who um, uh, set up the model, validated, calibrated, and then validated the, um, the, the model. Most importantly is that it has this um, connection between what happens on the land and then ends up in, in, in the water. Um, the subbasin, uh, um, sorry, the watershed was uh, divided in 90, 90 subbasins. Uh, based on more than a thousand hydrological response units in, in, in SWOT. Um, and the model was calibrated um, over this time period that you see here on the right hand side, um, starting with the, the, the water flows um, and then looking at sediment and, um, and total phosphorus slope based um, uh, loads based on, um, on available monitoring data throughout the, the, the watershed. Yeah, so it, it starts somewhere here in, in Dundalk and it ends somewhere here in, uh, in Dunville. Um, and, and depending on where you are in this watershed, there is more pressure on the agricultural land, especially here on the, um, on the Western side, there is intensive um, agricultural activity taking place. The land is highly productive. Um, and so imposing these BMP measures uh, here um, might actually result in higher economic costs. Even though you paid farmers living here the same amount of money within the watershed based on the rural water quality uh, uh, program um, uh, because those um, um, uh, incentive payments or cost sharing um, uh, payments are often um, fairly equal across the board throughout the, the, the basin. Um, we first look at the baseline scenario, what comes out of the mouth um, of, the, of the river, that's uh, more than 300,000 kilograms of total phosphorus that enters Lake Erie here. Um, every year, and then we developed a number of policy scenarios where we basically followed the Canada Ontario Lake Erie Action Plan. Um, we introduced 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 percent um, total phosphorus uh, re reductions um, at the mouth, given this amount of um, 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 total phosphorus coming from the agricultural land that you see here. These are the 90 uh, um, uh, sub watershed sub basins within the watershed the grand river watershed and you can already tell that there are differences in in um, in, in in the pressure so i'm i'm, I'm going to show you some of the results that hopefully illustrate the usefulness of, of of going through an exercise like this if we would just look at the environmental effectiveness or the environmental impact of these bmps um, running them through SWOT, um, wetlands are ranked number one. They, they have the highest bar here. Um, so they reduce most of the um, uh, phosphorus in kilograms per, per hectare, um, followed by buffer strips, nutrient management plants. Those are basically the uh, fertilizer um, reductions. And then finally, um, cover crops. This changes when we introduce costs. 
Um, and that is something that you see more generally. Um, if you do a cost effectiveness analysis, the ranking of the measures changes compared to just looking at the environmental um, impacts or the, or the pressure reduction and the impacts that that pressure reduction has on the water. Um, and what we also see in this diagram here is that there is a uh, difference between the use of financial costs and economic costs. Um, so um, most cost effective in, in terms of finances is, is this reduction of, um, of uh, fertilizer. Um, so that um, um, results in the lowest cost for the rural water quality uh, uh, program, followed by cover crops, wetlands, and then buffer strips. Um, but then if you look at the economic costs, you see that the cover crops are, are the most preferred um, uh, BMP, followed by buffer strips, um, fertilizer reduction, and finally wetlands. So whereas wetlands were the preferred um, BMP in terms of their effect on the uh, loading going into the uh, lake, if you do the cost effectiveness analysis based on uh, either the financial or the economic costs, um, the picture looks very, very different and they're not the most preferred um, measure. Um, just to illustrate um, to you based on, I think this is a, four, I cannot see the entire slide. Yeah, this is a 40% uh, reduction in fertilizer application um, um, across the entire uh, watershed. What you see here are the um, total um, annual economic costs. And, 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 and as you can see that the, the different colors indicate that the costs differ uh, substantially throughout the watershed, depending on where you apply this uh, reduction in fertilizer application. And so that is an important reason why we want to um, assess these economic costs. Um, then we estimated um, the um, reduction of phosphorus going into Lake Erie um, by combining these different BMPs across these 90 um, um, sub-basins. So um, you get um, many millions of possible combinations if you want to um, choose between these different um, BMP scenarios that I showed you in the beginning. Um, I think we have 12 different um, 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 options um, per subbasin, and we got 90 of these subbasins. So that gives you more than uh, 2 million uh, possible combinations. And so it's impossible to select these combinations, um, the best combinations of these BMPs in these different subbasins by hand. For that, you need an automatization uh, procedure. And that is what we're offering here. Um, if you run this through our economic optimization model, um, then you get a, um, a cost curve that looks like, like this. Uh, linking the phosphorus reduction to the uh, total annual cost, as expected, the economic costs outweigh the financial costs, as you can as you can see, um, and um, and you can then simply pick on the um, on the on the horizontal axis by how far you want to reduce the total amount of phosphorus coming um, out of the river and entering Lake Erie, um, and then you go to the left hand side and you see what the um, uh, total financial and economic costs involved are. And so keep in mind that the total baseline level was 386,000 uh, kilograms of um, um, total phosphorus um, entering Lake Erie. So that's on the right-hand side. We, we go up to almost 200 uh, here. So that's 40, 50% um, uh, reduction in, 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 in total. Um, we fitted the, the lines, then we have this um, also as a, as, a, as a function, and we can estimate the uh, amounts that we want to reduce uh, more precisely through that uh, function. This is how, um, um, this is a, a, dis, a discrete representation um, of these uh, reductions uh, by 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. Obviously, the, 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 the costs go uh, up, they go up in a non-linear way. That's another important um, point to make. So the economic costs, which are the orange colored uh, bars here, uh, they're higher than the blue uh, ones, which are the financial uh, costs, um, and they go up um, increasingly. So um, as you in, uh, increase the reduction of uh, total phosphorus, and that is what you also typically see um, um, basically maybe for any environmental problem, not just water quality, um, the, it's, it's, it's um, most expensive to uh, eliminate the, 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 the last uh, bits of pollution into, um, in, into the uh, environment. And so if we focus on this, 
40% reduction. Um, and so there are already guidelines for 40% reduction in the Western basin of Lake Erie. Um, you can read off here on the uh, vertical axis, how much that would cost in, 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 um, um, in financial and in economic terms. So here uh, in economic terms, it's around 75 uh, million Canadian dollars per year to reduce total phosphorus by 40%. Um, and this is how it looks like um, in terms of number of BMPs across these different um, sub-basins in, 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 um, in, in the Grand River uh, watershed. So um, the colors that you're going to see changing now is simply the number of BMPs. Obviously, you need to introduce more BMPs as your uh, TP reduction increases from 10% to 20 to 30 to 40 um, to 50%. A very interesting um, outcome that I can show you as well is that um, based on this optimization procedure, we're able to identify the composition of the program of measures that you need to achieve that reduction at the lowest cost possible. And here you see um, the financial cost optimum if we want to reduce um, uh, total phosphorus uh, loading going into Lake Erie by 40%. Um, and the different colors here um, simply represent the different options that we had in our choice set. So we can uh, 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 plant cover crops, we can reduce uh, fertilizers by 10%. It's referred to here as NMP, Nutrient Management Plan, uh, but it's, it's, it's in essence, it's a reduction of the amount of uh, fertilizer application. We have different types of uh, buffer strips, different, different in terms of the width of these uh, buffer strips. And then we have these two uh, wetlands options to do it on 2% of all agricultural land in the watershed or on 4%. Um, and then here on the horizontal axis, starting at number one, are the sub-basins. And one is all the way upstream. It's near Dunkalk, I think it's called. Um, and then here, number 90 is at the mouth of the river, um, Dunville, where the Grand River enters Lake Erie. And so um, per sub-basin, you can identify what type of measure should be implemented. And you see a lot of light and dark blue here, which are the wetlands, 4%. And the dark blue here is the um, fertilizer reduction by, by 50%. So this is the financial cost optimum. Now I'm going to show you the results for the economic cost optimum. And you see two different things. One is, first of all, the change in color. So that means that... Uh, excuse um, me, Roy. Uh, yes. I think uh, we should wrap up because we are closing to the last 10 minutes of the uh, yeah, hour. I'm, I'm almost there. Yeah, just, just to let Can you. Give me one okay. or two, just give me one or two more minutes. Yeah, so I, I just want to show two things. Differences in color. And here you see that there is also um, a, a recommendation to take measures here uh, further upstream. And you don't see that coming back here in the economic uh, optimum. Um, this is just another uh, diagram showing you uh, the same type of information, but summarized. Um, so there was a lot of light and dark blue. That were, those were the wetlands here. Um, and you see that in the economic optimum, you have more buffer strips and, uh, and, and cover crops. So these are the conclusions. Um, the cost effectiveness analysis changes the ranking of the BMP measures compared to, for example, looking at their effectiveness only. Economic costs are as expected higher than the financial costs. Um, if we want to reduce total phosphorus loading into Lake Erie by 40% in the uh, eastern basin, as uh, they do in um, um, the western basin, that would cost us something like 74 million per year. If you then compare that with the um, annual damage costs of eutrophication um, on the Canadian side of, um, of Lake Erie, which was 270 million, um, that investment in these BMPs in, in, in the Grand River watershed seems uh, justified, but it, you have to keep in mind that the Grand River is, um, is is a large watershed, but it's not the only watershed that discharges into um, uh, Lake Erie. So there are six other ones um, as well. So the next steps that we um, uh, plan to undertake is um, we want to um, uh, tr uh, transfer this um, uh, modeling framework to the other watersheds. Um, on the Canadian side, we want to account for uncertainties because that's not included in the um, in the SWOT model, in, in particular the, the legacies. Um, and then there are obviously these these water quality benefits. Um, so what what does it um, benefit uh, Ontario or, or um, the Grand River uh, watershed by implementing these uh, different um, uh, uh, BMP measures? So we avoid these damage costs, but there may be other uh, additional water quality benefits uh, associated with that as well. You're in very light gray. I'm not sure if you can see it. There are some more technical issues that we want to address further in, um, in, in the work. 
overview of references so far um, coming out. Here you see Leila's uh, publications coming out of her PhD here at the bottom, uh, on the lower part here, uh, the work with uh, George and, and, and others um, in, in, um, in, in the Great Lakes. Um, this was my last slide, and I just want to point out that um, in Global Water Futures, if you're interested in these non-market values, uh, we're organizing this, um, this webinar series starting um, in two weeks' time on the 16th of March um, on the value of water um, and people from Saskatchewan, um, including Ted Lloyd Smith and uh, Laurie Bradford, um, are also in that, um, in that webinar series. So thank you for your attention, and um, I think we're happy to take some questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Roy and George, uh, for this very interesting presentation. Um, I'm waiting for the for the question. People can type the question in chat or the uh, question uh, question and answer box if they want. Um, if not, I have uh, maybe a question. Um, so regarding the uh, cost uh, benefit analysis and the cost that we have to spend to reduce the load uh, of the nutrients to the Lake Erie. Um, this is only from the Canadian perspective. Uh, what about the US perspective? Um, is there any differences in the amount of cost that they have to spend to get to this level? Will they be willing? And what's the load from their side? George, shall I start and then you, you can... Sorry? No, I'm just asking George, shall I take oh, this yeah. question? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 go ahead, please. Um, yeah, so so the, the expectation is indeed that the cost will be very different again on the, um, on the US side. And... Um, um, we're, we're, so there are a few studies on the U.S. side that, like this. Um, um, I, I, I don't have the, uh, the, the, the exact numbers here um, uh, with me, but um, what we're interested still in is, is, is also connecting the work that we've done so far already on the Great Lakes to the, uh, to the U.S. side. And, and um, um, we're, 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 we're actually um, try, trying to... Um, um, uh, re-establish uh, connections with uh, Michigan State University, for example, um, where we have some contacts that, that may be interested in uh, collaborating with us. So the model structure uh, has already been developed on the Canadian side. Uh, George actually also has looked into the um, available data um, on the US side. We, we just need some resources to also be able to um, 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 develop the same type of modeling framework and then connect that to the to the, to the framework that we already have um, here here on the Canadian side and, and and the good thing again is that we're making use of a of, of, a, of an information system a system of national accounts that 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 is globally used so we we we're not um, um, so we just draw on the same um, underlying data set uh, data structure um, on the US side as what we've been using in, in Canada. Uh, that's, uh, that I think answers my question, but um, partly, uh, so uh, part of the question is, is there any understanding between uh, if there is effort on their side to do that, and if they are doing that, and uh, the nutrient loads, like um, are they much higher because the standards is also different? Those things like is there any understanding? I, I don't I don't mean exact, but do you have any? Uh... I I don't I don't have that understanding, but I I do know. I mean there are there are SWOT models on the U.S. side as well. There is also a um, a, a larger scale uh, SWOT model I think for 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 the whole of Lake Erie, um, but I'm not completely sure. There is there are maybe even also some other. Uh, model Sparrow. I, I'm not sure um, if I'm correct, but um, there are some people on the U.S. side. Uh, I, I think Philippe van Capellen was initially on this call as well. He will know much better than I do um, how connected these models um, are already. Um, but that is exactly what we need. We 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 need to understand that um, how uh, um, um, if we do something on a Canadian side, how will that affect? Uh, the entire lake and, and, and the same on the US side um, to, to be able to identify also for 
the, the uh, entire uh, uh, lake basin um, where it is cheapest to take these measures. And, and I, so I, do, I have never seen this kind of work here, but I do know that um, I actually did that kind of work in Europe where, where the Dutch are compensating the Germans for uh, flood control because the land value is so much higher in the Netherlands, which is densely populated. We don't have a lot of land, so there's scarcity that drives up the price of the land as well. And, and so um, you were referring to me working in the water ministry. One of the first things I did there was, was to um, write a report on um, um, storing water, excess water, coming down the, the River Rhine um, um, and the River Meuse in, in Germany and in Belgium, um, where there is more space and where the value of land is, um, is, is lower than in, a, in, in, in the Netherlands, for example. So th there are real um, uh, cost savings possible if you collaborate. Um, and, and so there is the International Joint Committee that, that tries to encourage and, 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 and gives it a, a nice framework. But um, I, I, I would not have, I would not mind seeing something like the European Water Framework Directive um, being a regulatory driver uh, to force a little bit more that kind of collaboration, um, because it will show you that you that you can probably save save some some money on both sides um, if you if you collaborate. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much for this elaborated answer. Uh, there is a question uh, put in the chat from uh, Tarek Aziz. Um, but the models, Swata and Sparrow, you described, are not integrated models. Do you plan to use an integrated water models and link to economic values? Yeah, yeah that's a good question, Tariq. So you're absolutely right. These are not integrated uh, models. So, so, so these models have to be linked to an economic optimization model. That is exactly what we did. So you can use them as standalone. And that's also what, what, what has been done um, um, uh, most frequently in the past, but there are also yeah. models on the US side where they con connected or, or um, uh, linked a SWOT model to an economic optimization model. Yeah, I hope that answered the Tariq question. Uh, so I think, uh, we don't have any other questions. We are coming to the top of the hour. I would like to thank, uh, yeah, hero, thanks. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Roy and uh, George for your time and uh, this interesting presentation. It was very insightful. Thank you very much. Uh, at the end of this meeting, I would like to uh, remind you that the next uh, thematical webinar of this series will be held on uh, 7th of April um, in Advances in Water Quality by uh, Professor Philippe van Kappelen uh, from University of Waterloo. So I think uh, we can close this uh, webinar. It was very interesting. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Roy. Thank you, George. Uh, and see you in the next webinar. Have a nice rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you.